Your Excellence, Ambassador Delia Alberto Domingo, foreign, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Philippines, thank you so much for um, uh, being here and for delivering a, a wonderful speech previously. We would like now to ask uh, some more questions um, on some very important issues. You are here to celebrate also the 25th anniversary of the um, fall of the Berlin Wall. Well, Germany is a very close country to your heart and we very much appreciate that you are back to the ICD on the occasion of the fall of the Berlin Wall. What are the lessons that we can learn from the reconciliation in Germany after the fall of the wall? Well, the uh, fall of the wall is not just significant for Germany. I think it is a global uh, sensation because it unified people, people who had been wrongly divided. Uh, many countries have gone through this experience, which makes it a, a uh, feeling that can be shared by many people. And earlier I talked about people power in the Philippines in 1986, when millions of people decided to take the fate of the country into their own hands by going against the ruler, but in a very peaceful way. And I think that the way the uh, unification came about in a most uh, peaceful uh, way demonstrates that the human spirit cannot be stopped by being free, free from any imposition of uh, a sense that will curtail one's uh, family relations, one's relationship with a country that was one in the past and was artificially divided. Mm -hmm. And I think there are messages that can be sent out to the rest of the world, how important it is to respect freedom uh, of people, freedom of choice, mm -hmm. freedom of being able to be what they want to be, mm -hmm. and without forcibly uh, walling them in so that they're not able to achieve what they normally are entitled to as human beings. Your Excellence, in your, in your speech today, you have mentioned that the history of Asia is very far from you. How do we get closer to Asia nowadays? Well, first of all, I want you to Google ASEAN because it's a very exciting area. Mm. And uh, I came here precisely to get people excited about Asia. Today, we are a region that you cannot dismiss because we are doing very well. And I think we have certain traditions that we can share. And I think that the question raised by our one of the uh, gentlemen that how could you be united when there is such diversity? Mm. And that precisely this is what tested us, that we believe that to be able to move ahead. We are 10 small countries, but if we move together, we can make a difference. Right, well, what role can then cultural diplomacy play in this regard? You know, when I chaired the Security Council in 2004, when the Philippines was a non-permanent member, I was very keen to introduce as my chosen agenda the role of civil society in post-conflict peace building. Mm. I always believe that civil society, uh, uh, diplomacy like uh, cultural diplomacy, or sometimes you call it public diplomacy because you would include other areas and not just culture, mm. uh, but which are not on the official level, I think they will make the difference in making the world a better world. Your Excellency, what are the models to look at uh, for the development and enlargement of Asia? Well, we're quite happy with, the, uh, with our uh, charter of 10 countries, mm. but we do not want to be isolated from the rest of our neighbors. Mm. Therefore, we have signed up free trade agreements with China, mm. with Japan, with Korea. Mm. They are what we call our dialogue partners. So we are not just integrating ourselves and separating ourselves from the other countries in Asia, but we have what you call the dialogue partners. We have fantastic mechanisms, and I, I am very proud to have been part of 
uh, designing those mechanisms so that we are not isolating ourselves. When I was foreign minister, I chaired the FIALAC. It's called Forum for East Asia and Latin America. Yeah. And there we engaged uh, Latin America with a group of uh, 10 ASEAN countries. So we are not just strengthening for the sake of strengthening our internal relations. We have strengthened our relations so that we can also meet together with other regions like uh, uh, Latin America. I, I, I was chairing that mm -hmm. and I was very happy to do it because it showed how much we can learn from each other. Yeah. Well, and, and the second question related to this topic would be, is EU a relevant model to look up to or to import? You know, the EU is 10 years older than ASEAN. We were supported very well by EU in building our early institutions. They have been, especially Germany, Germany has been the champion in uh, promoting not just intra-ASEAN relations, but relationship between ASEAN and the EU. For example, we had our eminent persons come and study how uh, regional organizations work. Uh, I remember our eminent persons went uh, from Brussels to Berlin and to other cities to see and talk to people how it was working for them. And from this dialogue, we were able to learn a few things that we should avoid. Right. Uh, not to build a very big uh, administrative body, for example, that will cut off the national uh, participation in decision making. Yeah. I think that was a major uh, lesson that we learned that we don't build a, a Brussels administrative machinery yeah. because you will get to a situation where others will say, well, why, are, why is uh, Brussels deciding for me? Right. Now I have a very specific question. What is Asian-Chinese uh, relations and how do, how, how do they develop now? through the eyes of a high-ranking Filipino official? Oh, actually, uh, I was one of the uh, first ASEAN DGs that opened our dialogue relations with China. Mm -hmm. I remember we identified uh, cooperation in science and technology. You see, this perhaps may be the secret of ASEAN. We do things incrementally. Right. We don't come with a big agreement and then disagree. Mm -hmm. What we do is to look for small but meaningful ways to be engaged with each other. And uh, in fact, your question, I just came back from China. I was awarded one of the 10 outstanding women in the APEC region because China is hosting. So uh, we're doing very well. Of course, we uh, have this uh, issue on the South China Sea, which is a very sensitive issue because it's an issue of boundaries. And I, th I always thought that boundaries cannot really be solved uh, black and white. You have to cooperate. I have seen examples like the Timor Gap Treaty between Australia and, and East Timor, where they jointly developed the, the gas reserves of the Timor Sea. So I'm looking at ways to avoid confrontation because nobody wins in a confrontation. You just destroy a relationship. And I spent one week, just before I came here, uh, visiting the Guizhou area. This is the mountainous area of China. I'm trying to understand how and why they, they think the way they do. And uh, for two years now, I've been attending the Boao Conference in Hainan. And it's an economic conference that is uh, something like the World Economic Forum, but it is led by, by China. Well, China, we have to uh, appreciate in terms of what it has done to address poverty in that country. And if you're talking about billions of people, not just millions, yeah. and to address poverty, I, I take my hat off the way they have uh, addressed this. And of course, they have had very, very difficult, uh, tough rules to enable them to address uh, the issue of poverty. Your Excellence, thank you for your answers and we are all now looking forward to hear your message regarding the empowerment of women worldwide. Oh, I'm uh, one of those uh, who believe that women have a special contribution to make in the world. In the World Economic Forum Gender Equity Index, 
The Philippines is the only Asian country that is rated among the top five that has narrowed the gender gap. Mm. The first was Iceland and all the Scandinavian countries. Out of 136 countries, that's quite a record because we have had general education for women. Education for women is very important. Mm. Uh, of course, some Asian countries would rather educate their sons mm. than the daughter. And you can still see this in many countries in, in, in Asia. But what I'm doing now is that while we have narrowed the gender gap, I look at it as a horizontal relationship. Mm. We have narrowed that. Uh, we are entitled to positions in government and in, in other uh, economic activities as the men. When I was foreign minister, 40% of our ambassadors were women. And I did not appoint them as, um, as women, bec but because they were up and coming. They were the ones really coming up. And, and it was a way to appreciate what they have done uh, professionally. What I'm doing now is to look at the uh, relationship between the women who are very successful and the bigger number of women who are poor and deprived of opportunities. So we have a platform doing that, and I'm, I'm uh, the patron. It's called Great Women. Great Women means, not great, we don't think we are great, but it's gender responsive economic actions for the transformation of women. For example, we stand for them when they get credit to start a little business. So this helps. We look, we provide designers to improve their handicraft. So giving more value to their products and so on and so forth. And I'm, I'm, I'm very much engaged in it. And uh, next year when we chair APEC, I'll also chair the Women in the Economy Forum, which is now a private sector a partnership with the public sector where I would like to make the Great Women platform, not just for the Philippines, but for the rest of the Asia-Pacific region. Your Excellence, Ambassador Delia Alberto Domingo, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Philippines, thank you so much for being here with us at ICD. Pleasure and uh, looking forward to inaugurating your lounge. It looks very nice when it's done. Yeah, we we'll look forward to have you here for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.